Ich glaube, ich spreche nicht nur für mich, wenn ich behaupte, dass alle im Saal eine ziemlich gute Vorstellung haben, in welcher Form und Weise Sex im Internet stattfindet. Ähm, der Ansatz unserer nächsten Rednerin ist aber ein anderer. Sie zeigt nämlich, ähm, wie die Öffentlichkeit von Sex im Netz Einfluss auf unser und euer Sexleben haben kann. Begrüßt mit mir Melissa Jerry Grant. Hello. I hope everyone is back from, from their smoke break and filters in, but we'll start anyway. Uh, my name is Melissa Girograt. I am based in New York City. I have been a blogger now for half my life, and I've been blogging about sex since I started blogging in 1999. Uh, let's see. I'm not sure because my German is not very good and doesn't extend much more beyond asking for a beer uh, what you heard in my introduction. But what I can tell you um, that's useful to know for this talk is that when I talk about sex in the internet, I'm actually talking about both my own life. Um, in anthropology, we would call that autoethnography. So I'm going to make some examples out of things that I've experienced online and try to make a bigger picture story about sex in the internet based on that. I'm also an educator, I'm an activist, I work at a foundation in the United States that funds feminist projects by young people working in access to sex education and also access to sexual and reproductive health services. I am a former sex worker and I'm also a lapsed academic. I dropped out of my undergraduate degree and I moved to San Francisco in 2003 to be part of what, thought, what I thought was going to be the, um, the next wave of the internet and it sort of panned out that way. Um, and ended up actually using the same kind of uh, skills that I learned as a, you know, a teenage blogger, basically. Things that we didn't really think were um, that helpful for one's professional life, certainly. When I started blogging in the, in the late 90s, I came to blogging for the same reason that I made zines, self-published magazines, when I was a teenager. I wanted to tell my own story in front of a much larger audience. And I don't think it was clear yet in 2003 that that was really going to become the base of where we're going next with the web. Things built on our own personal experiences and also opening up our personal lives more and more and more. All of the first blogs that I read dealt with sex and sexuality and some way, and I've watched how blogging has become somewhat more professionalized, for some people's definition of being professional, for sure. Um, this idea that if we're going to be seen as professionals, if the internet is going to grow up and become a place for business, we have to take all those oversharing or too personal conversations about sex and sexuality and move them off to the sidelines, move them off to the margins where people aren't going to see them. I remember going on to Yahoo in the late 90s in the ad that I would always see was for this webcam, and the webcam was always pointed at a young, sexy girl. And the ad wasn't necessarily selling sex, but it used sex and also a very sexualized experience of looking at cute girls on the internet on their webcams with the hope that they might also give you some attention as a way to sell this webcam. And there are lots of things you could point a webcam at. The first webcam uh, site ever online was pointed at a coffee machine at MIT so that people wouldn't have to go all the way downstairs to see when the coffee was actually going to be ready. And like everything on the internet, it didn't take long before someone, a girl, turned that camera on herself in her own life. That's how I got online. I wanted to do the same thing. And in the late 90s and early 2000s, that's what I did. I operated a webcam site. So my first experience of the internet was certainly that sex was everywhere that we go online, that there was actually not a lot of firm separation between things that had to do with sexuality and the kinds of activities that I took place in online, which at the time were blogging and also running my webcam site. And my webcam was pointed at my life in general, and that meant that sometimes over the course of living my life, I might do sexual things, I might masturbate, I might have sex with somebody, I might just sit there naked at my computer, which I'm sure all of us experience that, and it's not always very sexual, but certainly somebody looking at it might think that that was a really sexy thing to look at. This is something I saw uh, as soon as I got off the, the plane yesterday in Berlin. Uh, this is a sex shop that I saw uh, just out the window. I don't know too much more about it, except I loved that there were two women outside um, having a cigarette, presumably, I guess, before they went back into work, or maybe there were customers. I don't know. It's hard to, to draw any real story out of this photo except for one that we put onto it. But I show it here just to raise this issue of sex in the public square. 
And I feel like, and listening to Jeff Jarvis's talk this morning, he really advocated for us to think of the internet as a place, um, and not as a medium or a form of communications or even just information in general, but as a place where things happen. And I would agree with him that that might be a useful metaphor for looking at the internet. But if we're going to regulate how we have experiences together on the internet as a place, in the same way that physical space offline is regulated, I think that's going to bring up a lot of really interesting challenges. And I'm going to focus on the ones related to sex and sexuality. Um, you know, from this being sex in the public square, that's one thing. Um, you know, Germany is actually incredibly forward thinking, much more so than the United States when it comes to how, for example, prostitution is regulated. Um, but there are also a lot of downsides to that as well. Uh, this was a, a website that I found this morning after uh, the folks who run it said hi to me on Twitter and welcomed me to Berlin, which was fantastic and kind of unexpected. Uh, you know, I, I look at prostitution and sex work more generally, so that would include prostitution, but also other kinds of commercial sexual services like the webcam sites or like making porn or massage services and things like that. Uh, I look at sex work as a really useful way for us to think about how we negotiate sex in public spaces. And if the internet is going to be perceived by us as just an extension of the public square, then I think it's really helpful to start thinking about sexuality in that terms. How do we regulate sex offline and how are we going to bring that into how sex is regulated online? And I think to ask the really important questions about that actually doesn't mean looking at people like sex workers or people who make porn or people who sell and buy sex toys. I think it's useful to kind of look in the places where we might not think of sexuality. Look on the websites where we spend most of our time and to turn our gaze away from the people that we think of as like the sexual people, whether that's all women or young women or queer people or people who buy and sell sex, and think about all of us, and also think about the people who regulate those practices, whether they intend to or not. Flickr is a fantastic example. When Flickr started, I'm not sure that a core of it was thinking about how this service would enable people with very unusual, maybe to them, sexual desires and fantasies might share those with a larger world, and how that sharing was going to come into contact with those of us just on Flickr looking at pictures of flowers and kittens and last night's party and all of those other things you might go to Flickr to do. So this is a search on my Flickr stream for the photo on toes. And I show it to you because I have this fan of my toes on Flickr. I'll, I don't know if he's watching, but I'll step out here so they're more visible. Uh, he, he leaves comments on every single photo I post to Flickr that have my feet in them. And this isn't pornography. I mean, this photo doesn't violate Flickr's terms of service in any way, shape, or form. Neither does this one. Uh, but I know from my own experience and the experience of many women and generally anybody who posts photos of their feet to Flickr, that they're going to develop a fandom like this, that people who are into looking at their feet are going to come and be their friend and leave comments like this. I don't find it particularly damaging or scary. Some people might. But it's just an, an interesting way that this, this phenomenon of sharing something that we don't even think is sexual, I'm just sitting in a chair getting a pedicure, that's somebody else's sexual fantasy somewhere. And if I post that online, they're going to be able to share in that fantasy. Uh, the way that that gets brought up in kind of policy conversations is the internet's a very scary place and it's full of perverts and perverts are going to do bad things to you. I feel like everybody has come across that kind of news story at least once or 50 times when they've been reading the news on the web. I would disagree with that. Those kind of stories come from this premise that sex isn't something that we are a part of, but that sex is something that happens to us. And when we start to think of sex that way, we actually take all of the control and agency that we have as people out of the equation of looking at sex. And this is somewhere where I actually don't really look at the folks who've been doing a lot of thinking about how we interact with the internet and how the internet shapes our identity and our experience in the world. But I look to sex and gender theorists to start to think about how is it that we even think about sexuality and how does that shape the experiences we have with other people. I don't think the people who write books about how the internet works have gotten to some really interesting kind of resolutions or even questions 
about sex. And I think that has everything to do with how our larger culture thinks about sex. It has nothing to do with the internet being an especially bad or sexual or extra scary place that we don't have the answers to uh, its questions on sex yet. Just think we haven't really gone into it fully. And the people who have these kinds of experiences of you know, getting to sit around and study sex in an academic way, an experience that I've had, have got to really look at the internet yet. So I'm going to turn to some of those questions now. Sorry to keep doing that to you. Uh, for a time, I worked for a website called Valleywag. It's published by Gawker Media. And Valleywag was a blog of gossip about Silicon Valley in particular and the tech industry in general. And I got to a certain point writing there where I felt like, you know, as the only woman on the masthead of the site, and as the one who was often writing stories about sex, which I wanted to, I had to deal with this question head on. Why is the internet? You know, and people who advocate for free speech on the internet and open spaces on the internet, they get it to a point. But when it comes to being sexual, we fall back on the same double standards and the same stereotypes that are perpetuated by the larger culture. So women, for example, who go online are still given these messages of, you know, protect yourself and be careful. And there are scary people out there who might look at you or who might give you a bad comment or might, you know, call you a name because the worst thing that could ever happen to anybody is being called a whore, right? I felt like that discourse had gotten so loud that I wanted to kind of flip it and say, actually, this is really important that people have these spaces to go on and share these stories and connect with other people. And asking people to be silent or censor themselves is the wrong approach. We wouldn't take it around file sharing. We wouldn't take it around net neutrality. We wouldn't take it even around talking about medical issues. We wouldn't take it about talking about our jobs. But when it comes to sex, we're expected to remain silent if we want to remain safe. And I find that to be very dangerous. There was an incident last spring when, due to an error at Amazon.com, on the book side of the site, uh, over 700 titles were accidentally labeled as adult that actually were tagged GLBT, or youth sexuality. So these were books that were not necessarily explicit, but these were books about sex education, sexual identity, sexual relationships. And as far as we can tell, because of one employee's error, intended or not, all of these books were labeled adult. And what the effect of that was with these books were removed from public search on the website so that somebody going to look for these titles couldn't find them. They weren't being recommended as related titles. Because they were labeled adult, they were made completely invisible. And I know some of the authors who had books that were affected in this. I went into the site looking for Jessica Valenti's book, Full Frontal Feminism, which is a book of feminist theory, and I couldn't find it. But a porn video was recommended to me, and I found that very uncomfortable that this book that wasn't explicit was being held behind the wall as too adult or inappropriate, but a flat-out porn video, and I have no problem with porn, I watch porn, I've made porn, but that this was being offered to me as an alternative. Um, when we rely on filtering systems that are based on other people's ideas of what's appropriate or inappropriate or offensive or inoffensive, they're going to be wrong. And the effect of that is actually stifling speech and our access to information. So Amazon actually wrestled with this for a couple of days in public, and bloggers tried to hold them accountable to it. And eventually it came out that it was one coder's error. But this is not the worst thing on Amazon when it comes to how sexual information is filtered and our access to it is curbed. This was a complete accident, but built into Amazon's policy is this idea that you know, some information should be in public search and some information can be sold through Amazon and some cannot. I'll get into that in a second. Just thought it would be helpful before I start to pick on Amazon a little bit to say something uh, nice about Jeff Bezos, who is the, the founder. And here's a photo of him from Valleywag. This is not an actual photo of Jeff Bezos, but I like to imagine him you know, having this moment and being somewhat sex positive himself. And this is a quote from John Doerr, who's one of the investors in Amazon and also in Google telling a story about uh, Amazon's early days. And he recalled being in Amazon's shipping area that when an order went out that included a book about programming, it also had a copy of The Joy of Sex in it. And the conclusion that John Doerr took from that was that the customers of Amazon were mostly male, which we know isn't true. Uh, they were nerds who had no social or sex lives, as if those are the same thing, even though we nerds 
have sex, and also that they were trying to get help by using an online service, which I think is pretty true. That there was something really unique that was going on at Amazon, where all of a sudden people who would never walk into an adult bookstore or even a, a, a conventional bookstore and buy a book about sex could do that in their own home with privacy. And capitalizing on that moment was part of how Amazon actually started to take off in the investors' minds. And if you go to Amazon right now, you can go look up the joy of sex, and you can start to read a few pages from it, which I wouldn't recommend. I think the book is incredibly outdated and makes a lot of weird assumptions about sex, but that could be said about a lot of sexual material that one can find online. We're not always going to agree with it. But what what I see now in the kind of assumptions of you know content filtering, whether that's Amazon or Apple or Google, when sexual information is filtered out behind safe search walls or on Flickr, where we're asked to label our content as either safe or moderate or restricted, all of these kinds of activities actually are not premised on sex being something that we have and we enjoy and that it's ours, but that. Sex is something that could happen to other people who come across this content. We have to protect people from this content, and the next step in that kind of thinking gets to this place of, well, sex isn't about me. This is about the other people. Sex is something that happens to other people. I'm, I'm normal. I have the good kind of sex. I'm, you know, just a person. But it's those bad other people out there who might come onto my service and cause problems. It's those people over there who might abuse my terms of service and put up porn ads. It's those. Porn bots on Twitter that we have to control, and it ends up becoming a moment where we take our own power out of the equation again, where we start to think that sex is happening to these bad people over there, and we have to keep ourselves、uh, cut off from it. Here is Amazon's content guidelines around what can be sold on Amazon. So these apply to somebody who wants to sell books or open a store on Amazon and sell their own materials. And, and flat out, it says you can't sell pornography, X-rated movies, including magazines, and that you can't sell adult-only novelty items that are primarily sold through adult-only novelty stores and erotic boutiques. The nudity is okay. So long as it's not, you know, visible on the title page of the posting. Well, okay, that doesn't seem to be universally applied throughout Amazon. I'm sure you could find lots of other examples of that. I'm going to hazard a guess that why this Helmut Newton book and other kinds of conventional book titles that you could find in any bookstore, not just in an adult bookstore, are going to make the pass. And it tends to be content that you would have to go into, you know, a special bookstore or something that's seen as too explicit or too amateur that doesn't. Make the pass, and again, I think this is very dangerous. That when we talk about transparency online, you know, yeah, we can go in and read those regulations, and they can tell us what should and shouldn't be online, what Amazon will and won't sell. But they are not applied uniformly, and they're applied in such a way that folks who have power and money actually can fight those regulations, and the average person is not going to question them. The average person who might have a huge library of Playboys back to the 1940s that they found at a garage sale. Isn't going to know if they can put those on Amazon and get into a problem with Amazon as a website. You can also buy Playgirl, even though again magazines are supposedly not okay for sale on Amazon. You can go in and get this issue of Playboy with、uh, Levi Johnston, who is、uh, intimately connected with the, I really hope, not presidential candidate in the U.S., Sarah Palin. So Amazon Web Services, another another part of Amazon. Why I show you this is I feel like there are a lot、uh, more specific here about what kind of content is okay and not okay. So no illegal, harmful, or offensive content. And they break down offensive content like this: anything that's defamatory, obscene, abusive, and invasive of privacy, or otherwise objectionable. No definition of what that might be. That could be a lot of things, but they say it includes content that's child pornography, relates to bestiality, or depicts depicts non-consensual sex acts. Because of course, you know, if I showed you a picture of two people having sex, you could definitely decide whether that was consensual or not, right? You could tell that from looking at a photo, maybe from reading a story or from a video, but. Again, this requires a certain amount, like no other content, a certain amount of human error and human decision to make these calls. 
And I would argue that most of the time those calls are actually not made even based on that person's own individual feelings about sex or sexuality, that they're made with a very conservative reach because they're concerned about implicating the corporation they work for in lawsuits or other kinds of uh, you know, negative things that might happen to them if they're perceived as a pornographer. And I have friends who, you know, from my time in San Francisco and covering the web scene and covering startups, who would come into this over and over again with their, their companies, not being sure if something you know, made the pass or not. I had a friend who worked at Yahoo Video back when that still existed, who would send me clips that were posted to Yahoo Video that he wasn't sure if he should actually allow to remain on the site because it wasn't clear if they were actually pornography or not. He had one favorite user, this German man who would put himself into a full latex bodysuit. And all the video was was him just standing there in front of the camera, zipping himself into the suit and just smiling at you. And Three or four videos after this, he actually posted one where after he put himself into the suit, he slipped on the latex, because it's very slippery, and fell over. And then went over to the camera and turned it back around and continued taping. So it felt like this is somebody who has like a lot of awareness about what they're doing. These aren't just accidental videos that came out of you know who knows where. And they don't technically violate uh, Yahoo's terms of service on sexual content, but this is definitely a depiction of a sexual fetish. And so, you know, who is going to make that decision? Are you going to make the much more conservative decision that this might be pornography, this might be sexual, which this person did, and remove it from the website? Or are you going to make a case that, you know, maybe we don't know, or maybe this is different for everybody, and we should leave it on the website? You know, for a site where you can't get pornography, you can buy Deep Throat. And for another site where supposedly you can't get porn is the, uh, the iTunes App Store and also the iTunes Store in general. This is a quote from Steve Jobs a couple days ago. And someone, uh, Ryan Block from the site Gadget and formerly of Engadget, asked him a question at the launch of the iPhone 4.0 OS and said to him, you know, what... What do, you believe about, uh, what do you believe that Apple will do with the new OS in terms of allowing users to submit any app that they want to the store? Or, you know, maybe even being able to go outside the store and just let users post apps and share apps with each other without having to interface with the iTunes app store. And Steve Jobs' response was to talk about the Android phone and the Android store, and to say that the Android store actually has a porn store inside of it where you can download, your kids can download porn, and that's a place that we don't want to go, so we're not going to. So this assumption that if you open the doors to everybody, porn is going to be the first thing that shows up, which is probably true. And that and when porn shows up, it's going to be really, really bad because think of the children. Because of course, no one at Apple, no adults at Apple look at pornography, right? So we're going to use porn as our way to tell all of you that no, we're not going to open up the app store to any user. We're not going to have an open platform in the way that Android functions for applications because I would argue it probably has nothing to do with pornography. And so did a lot of other people who called him into account on this saying, this actually sounds like you just want our money, but you're using porn and saving the children as your dodge, and that's really not that uncommon. So many conversations about what kinds of materials we should or should not be able to see or what kinds of experiences we can share with each other online, someone brings up porn, someone brings up saving the children, and the conversation is shut down. Because who wants to have that conversation at that point? Who wants to be perceived as someone who's advocating for something dangerous or harmful, and we don't necessarily have a good way to talk to one another about how it's actually a lot more complex than that? And that when you start to curb people's access to this kind of information, you're actually doing harm to them. Very few people want to advocate for that position. Here's the outcome of this kind of policy at Apple. This is this page for Radio Lab, which is a show put out by National Public Radio. It's from New York City. And this is where you can download episodes of Radio Lab from the iTunes Store if you wanted to. And when I first came across this, I looking at show number 42 there, it's S asterisk, 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 M. Now, I had had a podcast myself in the iTunes Music Store for a while, and it had words that were censored from it. But I couldn't for the life of me, even as someone who is exposed to a lot of sexual material, figure out what this word even was. <laughs> what are they censoring here? And it was only when I finally listened to the show that I figured out the word was sperm. The word sperm is inappropriate for the iTunes store. The word sperm, which many of us probably came across if we were lucky enough to get sex education in our schools or from somebody else, the word sperm is an age-appropriate word. 
usually when we're talking about sex, and at least if we're talking about reproduction, how could you not talk about reproduction without talking about sperm? But if you're Apple, somebody at Apple made the call that we can't have the word sperm in this public place. The same people who access this on their own computers, were they to go into a library, could probably find the word sperm in a lot of things. Not here. What I want to propose moving forward, as we think about the ways that both outside people, folks in government, policymakers, are going to start to police the internet and regulate the internet, and also the ways in which those of us who work for companies or media production regulate our users' experiences on the internet, and also the way that we as users and consumers and creators of material on the internet self-censor, that we ought to consider that sex is actually not something for some people over here who are bad people who are going to disrupt us, or that sex is this dangerous thing that's going to come into our website or our service or our publishing, publishing uh, arena like iTunes and make things complicated and dangerous, and that the best thing we should do is just like kind of try to leave it over here, that sex actually includes all of us, and it is for all of us. And that all of these solutions, these supposed solutions for keeping people safe, for deciding what kind of content is appropriate or not, in the very act of drawing a line in the sand, you are excluding people. You are pushing people to the sidelines. You are pushing people's experiences to the margins. And that is actually where they are not very safe. To make certain people's lives and experiences too dangerous to talk about is an incredibly dehumanizing thing to do. And that we may be making these decisions out of financial interests more so than our human interest and how we actually envision a world in which we all are treated fairly and all have access to the information and lives that we deserve. These are some people who I think are doing it right and are doing it really well. This is Scarletine. Scarletine.com is a website based in the United States. It's a sexuality, educate, focus, sexuality education website for young people. Um, I also find it incredibly useful as a former young person at 32. It is one of the only common sense websites there is that breaks down sexual health information, sexual uh, infection information, and also information about sex and relationships. If I were ever in a relationship with someone and I was scared that they may have been exposed to something or that I have been exposed to something because of sex I had with them, this is the first thing I would send to them. It is so common sense that it makes even those very scary conversations we might have to have that much safer to have. I would hate to have a website like Scarletine perceived as inappropriate or too much or dangerous for young people to look at. They've had a lot of problems, and they've also had some, some successes. The so-called Child Online Protection Act, COPA, is something that was defeated in the United States because of the efforts of Heather Corinna, who operates Scarletine. Heather is an adult who runs the site. She's an ally to the young people on the site. There's a forum on the site where you can go and ask questions. And Heather is the one who recruits volunteers and also trains them on how to answer those questions fairly. So you actually have young people providing sex education to other young people. And at times, that's going to be explicit. And at times, that might violate the terms of service of, say, Yahoo Answers, where if you've ever tried to get an educational question about sex answered by going on Yahoo Answers, you're probably not going to get very accurate information. But on a site like Scarletine, where Heather has actually worked with young people and educated them on how to sensitively answer these questions, you're going to get some good information from people. You're also going to get peer support. I mean, one of the most valuable things that, that I think Jeff Jarvis said this morning in his talk was how... Groundbreaking it was for him to post the story of his experiences with prostate cancer online because other folks who'd had those experiences were able to tell him what it was like. And I think the same is especially true for sexual health issues. We are so shamed and so silenced around these issues that to actually have someone talk to you honestly is incredibly rare. And because of the anonymity that the internet affords, it's actually a place where those conversations can happen. So I was very proud that Heather, someone who does this very well, was one of the forces with the American Civil Liberties Union in defeating the Child Online Protection Act, arguing that it would not protect young people, it would actually put them at further risk.
I think another site that does this very well is sort of unlikely. It's about .com sexuality section. It's edited by a sex educator named Corey Silverberg. He's the author of The Ultimate Guide to Sex and Disability. And he also works for a feminist sex toy cooperative in Toronto called Come As You Are. And about .com is also incredibly common sense. It's located in a space that we don't normally think of as incredibly sexual, about.com. It's also a site owned by the New York Times publishing company. And yet it's a site where you can get very matter-of-fact, explicit and actually like pretty useful information about sexuality. I mean, they do do some of the things that other websites have to do around search engine optimization, and there's lots of ads and things like that, which you won't see at Scarletine. But it has such a reach, and it's so mainstream, and I feel like we don't see that very often. That when you see a site of sexual education online, it's kind of perceived that the people looking at it are like a certain kind of people, either from a subculture or, you know, really cool people who have like really better sex than you, and it kind of talks down to you. And I feel like that we don't have enough kind of common sense just here Here's your sex information, right next to your information on how to download a BitTorrent file, right down next to your information about how to convert your electricity in your hotel, which I had to figure out today. So it's incredibly profound the way I think that the, the impact of having sexual information in a space where you get information on anything else. Another site that I think does this very well, and this is sort of a plug because I did some work on this site, but it's the, really the creation of Nancy Schwartzman, a filmmaker based in New York City. And she created a film um, called The Line that talks really sensitively and really directly about the question of sex and consent and where is the line of consent for people and sex. Now, thinking back to the, uh, Amazon's regulations around, you know, you can't depict any non-consensual sex act. How are we going to have conversations about rape where we might need to tell stories about non-consensual sex? And how are those stories going to be regulated and understood by folks who regulate our content online? Well, what Nancy has done is taken advantage of the fact that people really want to talk about this issue and don't have a lot of place to do it, and created a campaign where folks can directly answer this question, where is your line, by writing it on a sticker or writing it out as a blog post and submitting it. And the site's actually a group blog written by all the people who visit the site. Another example, uh, this is Sex Worker Literati's Blip TV channel. And Sex Worker Literati is a live event that's held in New York City. It is a night of storytelling. There's four to six people who read once a month stories about the sex industry. So these are folks who have experience as sex workers, but also folks who have experiences you know, outside of their sex work that they would like to tell stories about. And in an environment where they're having been sex, worker, been sex workers is not going to be judged. The kinds of stories you probably can't even get on broadcast cable, uh, broadcast TV, and certainly um, you know, not in public media, though maybe that's changing. You might be able to find these kinds of stories you know, on cable TV, but they're probably going to be really sensationalized. And the kinds of stories that we get to hear from sex workers often fall into that camp. It's either really, 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 really bad, it's the worst thing that ever happened to me, or it's really, 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 really fantastic, and I'm going to get an HBO show about it. This is somewhere in the middle, somewhere in that kind of huge middle space where like most people's experience of sex work and also most people's experiences of sex kind of lie. They're complicated and they're not mediated by anybody. I mean, just like the, the very first kind of early video blogging communities rally and cry that we are the media, sex workers themselves are producing these videos and posting them to the site. There is no filter. And I would hate, even though people aren't taking their clothes off and there certainly aren't depictions of people having sex in this video, I would hate for this kind of content to be seen as objectionable by anybody. And Blip TV, to their credit, shows it just like any other video on the website. It's a story uh, that happened to a friend of mine on Tumblr last week. Uh, she's a blogger in Chicago, and so she takes, place, she takes part in this community on Flickr where she takes a photo of what she wears every day. A lot of people do that, or enough people to have like, communities of them on Flickr do it anyway. And she noticed that because you can go in and see a feed of all of the activity on your photos, all the comments and all the likes that people have registered on your photos, that somebody, this one user had liked like tons of her photos and had like left all these comments on them that she wasn't really excited about. So she posted this, a screenshot of this online and asked people kind of what they thought about it. And somebody asked her, you know, well, this is all on Flickr, right? Why don't you just make the pictures of yourself private? That's how I do it. Everything's private on my Flickr. And what I love about her response is it like leaves 
kind of this open space for us to think about this question without saying, I know I have to make everything private because bad, scary men and oh my God. And it also doesn't just say like, well, I'm going to put everything out there and fuck people who can't deal with it. Fuck people who can't deal with me being in public as a woman. Fuck people who can't deal with me being in public as a large woman looking gorgeous and talking about herself in sexy ways. Most people's experiences of public and private are kind of more complex and in that middle space, where some things we might want to be really public and some things we might want to be really private. It's not just a binary of on or off. And we have to contend with what that is when we build things like this and when we interact with websites like Flickr. So her response as a user I thought was so cool. She says, yeah, I know that creepsters come with the territory of having myself out there online, but I just prefer it when they can't interact with me. And I think that's, it's not a binary answer. It doesn't say I'm going to take all my photos down, and it doesn't say I'm going to ask him to get kicked off the site. It says I want to put myself out there, but I don't want to have to interact with people who are going to approach me in this way. I think that's really a complex and very smart way to deal with this question. My last example, which is the only plug I'm going to make uh, for my own work, and also it's the last slide. Um, this is a book that I was working on with my friend Megan O'Connell called Coming and Crying. And we're actually still working on it because we got the funds to print this book ourselves using a website called kickstarter.com. So we, for 90 days, 90 days, 45 days, 45 days, ran a fundraising drive on kickstarter.com telling people what we want to do is we want to make a book of real stories about sex. And you know, the backstory on this is that Megan and I met through Tumblr. That was about a year and a half ago. Now Megan works at Tumblr. And part of the reason that Megan was hired as Tumblr's director of outreach is because she was like a really good blogger on Tumblr. She told really good stories and engaged a lot of people. And sometimes those were stories about sex. And Megan's one of the only people I know working inside of a startup who openly blogs about sex under her real name. And that's like considered like a part of her job. And I think that's really amazing. And maybe that's going to start to shift, that, you know, the sensibility of um, you know, the editor that Jarvis quoted this morning saying that he wouldn't hire a journalist who didn't have a blog. You know, if you're going to have a blog, there's going to be stuff on there that might not be for the public. And I would like us not to have to think that if I want to be perceived as professional in the work environment, I can't write about these things online. I think that those conventions are changing, and I think it's actually really healthy. And we should continue to create opportunities to question what it is to be professional and what it is to be unprofessional. Um, so the, the positive thing about all of this, you know, aside from the fact that we raised 17,000 US dollars across 651 people, and we're going to be able to make a book of all of our favorite writers from the internet writing about sex, most of these people are people we've never met, but they're people that we've traded stories about sex with, usually late at night, and sometimes in a very emotional kind of mindset. You might find yourself blogging sad late at night. I hope I'm not the only one who does that. Um, and we have at least 20 other writers who've had that experience too, having these kind of intense experiences about sex that aren't quite erotica. I mean, the, the stories aren't meant to be pornographic, and, and they're not educational either. They're kind of in this space here. Um, they're kind of, you know, stories that make us question even like what it means to have sex and why we have sex with people and why does it affect us emotionally. And even in the publishing world, the print world, you know, as unstable as it is right now, it's never had a very good place for that kind of storytelling. And the internet has been a haven for that kind of storytelling. And I would like that to be able to continue. But we still wanted to put it in a book for whatever reasons. We still worship books. It's complicated. So the payment processor for kickstarter.com is Amazon. We were like, well, what's going to happen when we um, you know, have to get to that moment where everyone's credit cards are charged? And we went and reached out to the people who run Kickstarter and said, we don't want to get you into trouble. We don't want you to, you know, all these other projects on Kickstarter are really great and we don't want Amazon to like not work with you because we brought the dirty, dirty sex book to your site and like, how's that going to go? And they were super supportive, and they said, we love your name, don't ever change it. And um, as of this moment, we are the fourth most popular project ever on Kickstarter in their one-year-long history. So apparently people in that community anyway um, weren't scared of the book. And seeing it right up on this index of past projects next to a book about Obama and next to a, a sci-fi book from San Francisco by a writer named Robin Sloan and next to a comic book about how to survive as an artist when you're broke called Poorcraft is really cool. The Kickstarter didn't make the decision to shunt off anything with sex like over here and you have to log in and say you're 18 and you want to see it and really you're not going to be offended. It's right there with everything else. And I think that's really profound. I think it's really smart. And I would hope it's the future of what we move towards because 
I can't say it often enough. Sex is about all of us. This isn't just about the bad people in raincoats um, somewhere who might do really bad things to us. This isn't about the people who are going to come in and disrupt our site. This isn't about um, you know, those bad people who are on the internet only look at porn, right? Because people who look at porn never Google like cancer or you know, look at the New York Times. That we're like separate people. Like we're all people, all online, all looking at different kinds of things all of the time, and sex is just part of that. And if we design our online experiences and interact with each other online in such a way that we think sex can just be sliced off and shoved to the margins. We're actually doing that to other people, and we're doing that to ourselves. Thank you. I'm going to open up for some questions. I think I will have a microphone to do that with. Yes? Can I take yours? Do you want to do it? Or? OK. Do you guys mind if I come out here and do this with you? I liked that Jeff did that this morning. Who, who is the first question? There's a microphone right there. But if we're standing next to each other, I think you'll be amplified. Don't make me walk right next to you. There you are. Do you, do you think there should be a category like objectionable content at all? Do I think there should be one? A Do you think there should be a classification like objectionable content at all? I would argue it depends on context, right? Like what I think might be objectionable on Google or might be objectionable on a blog is going to be really different. And these kind of blanket ideas that something is objectionable in all cases at all times is it doesn't work for us. So, so it's more like an out of context problem. I think it's a context collapse problem. I think that's part of it. Are folks familiar with that concept? The idea that like, what we say in one context, say like on our MySpace page, might not be appropriate when it shows up on CNN. That, that you know, people who we made friends with in college, who maybe we want to talk about sexual experiences with, and they wouldn't object to that. And then our mother joins Facebook, and now she's going to see those same things too. How do you verify what's objectionable there? It has so much to do with the people and the kind of the momentary interactions you have with them, rather than universal interactions that none of us have. None of us have universal interactions with all people in the same ways on websites. I think that has to be taken into consideration. Hi. Um, what do you think are the chances that um, your approach is ever going to be sufficiently popular in the United States for something which really happen in, in public discourse. Because America, there's, it's this weird country where you have, uh, well, um, I, I think it's still sorry, legal in Alabama, and you have an annual masturbate-a-thon in, in San Francisco. It's such a big country, and, and you have at least two halves that are completely incompatible, and you're speaking for one half, but the other half is there as well. So how do you bridge that? Yeah, I think people in the red states quote unquote, still have sex. So that's complicated. I mean, it isn't just divided that way. It's one, in one of the most conservative parts of the state of California where porn is legal to be made and most porn actually is made. I think, you know, America is divided in not so much into red state or blue state and sexually permissive and, you know, sexually regressive but that most of us like are kind of in the complicated place where like what we might say at home and what we might say to our partners is really different than the kinds of policies we advocate for. And there isn't a lot of public support for advocating for things really rationally and soundly and based on people's experiences because we don't have a discourse of public sex in America. We can talk about danger, we can talk about disease, and we can talk about you know, bad things that might happen to your reputation, but we don't talk about the positives we don't talk about pleasure. And I feel like that's part of the reason people are really stuck. And you get that kind of double discourse, what people say amongst their friends and their family, and then the kinds of things that win at the ballot box. And until that divide is more like this, I think we're going to be very stuck. I think you're totally right. More questions? How's the Android porn store called? The porn store? <laughs> on Android. I, I, I looked for it, but uh, couldn't find it. Yeah, I didn't have time to look at any porn in Android's porn store today. I actually probably look at less porn than maybe like half the people in the room. It's something about like once you've made it, you stop spending so much time looking at it. I don't know what that's about. 
More questions? <laughs> BitTorrent. Any other questions? I'm going to take a poll. Who has a question, but they totally don't want to like, ask it and like, have it recorded on the internet? And that's not why they're asking a question right now. You can put up your hand. I don't want my question on the internet. OK, well, I thought that people might get scared. And that's all right. Because, well, it's not all right. I mean, it's kind of complicated. but. Uh, one more. Oh, there okay. is a question. Uh, yeah. um, uh, you talked about sex and the internet. Well, it sounds weird hearing yourself. <laughs> um, but I was wondering, I, I had the feeling that you talked about a very certain small kind of underground part of sex on the internet. Because when I normally think of porn or sex on the internet, I think of the big um, commercial websites. I think of the YouTube-like porn websites and stuff like that. So I had, I had the feeling that you showed us only a very small part of actually what's happening of sex on the internet. And that was a very conscious choice. I feel like most of the time we talk about sex online, we you know, only talk about the people that we think are being sexual, the people who go to porn sites, or we talk about the mechanics of Xtube or YouPorn or things like that. We very rarely turn our gaze and look at the people who make decisions about how we interact with those websites. So that's why I focused my critique on things like Amazon and Apple and rather than like bang bus. Because I think that's like a little too obvious and a little too easy. And also it's what we talk about most of the time. It's really easy to talk about who should ask have access to porn, it's a lot harder to talk about who in positions of power, who are you know, making decisions on a daily basis about what kinds of information we should have access to, what kinds of thinking motivates their decision making. That's why I shifted my focus there. Um, okay, like uh, one, one thesis of you was that um, the porn on the internet has a very big influence on our, uh, the way we do probably sex at our homes as well. Did I understand it right? So you, are you proposing that the kinds of sex that we see in pornography, you're saying that you believe that has a relationship to the way that we have sex in our own lives yes. and the ways we police sex? Yes. I don't think it has much of an actual relationship at all. I think lots of people see things in porn and, and have fantasies about sex acts that they would never actually do. I mean, with the exception of the people behind the camera making porn, uh, there's no actual sex happening in most people's experience of pornography. And so porn for most people is a question of fantasy, and there are things that they will fantasize about that they would never want to have other people do or have done to them. And that might also be part of the disconnect, is that the biggest mass media we have for sex is something that has largely to do with our fantasies and doesn't really address what we do day to day, what we want to happen day to day. I think that's okay to have a place where we can fantasize. But if that's the only thing, and the only thing that somebody who wants to make material about sex, I mean, part of the reason I ever made porn is because I knew I wanted to make media about sex. And the only media understood to be about sex is pornography, and that's an incredibly limited kind of media. I think it's a very valid form of media, but I think if everything we have to say about sex is perceived as pornography, we're having trouble here understanding what we mean by porn. Hi. First off, I wanted to uh, thank you for actually mentioning Scarlet Team because I used to be a community worker there and it's an awesome site and it's done a lot of good in a lot of teenage lives and so thank you for mentioning it and Heather's doing great work there. So uh, what I actually wanted to ask you is, there's, um, you mentioned policing t um, sexuality and I, I think especially teen sexuality is always you know, portrayed as something that's really dangerous and that really needs to be watched and that is inherently horrible and I think um, there's a lot of um, misunderstanding in the media of teen sex um, and there's a lot of bad journalism when it comes to sexting and whatever. What do you think, and like lots of people here are journalists and I, and I wonder what do you think, how should, how should we you know, write about it and how can, what can we do to not fall into the trap and you know, 
portray sex as something that's so bad and terrible and whatever. Right. Especially when sex intersects with like a new technology, yeah, right? Exactly. Like, yeah. like, that's what I mean. Right? Like, like, like or, SMS or like Facebook. Yeah, or you know, the, I heard the story um, that Dan Savage mentioned on Savage Love about um, these teenage girls who put up naked pictures of themselves on MySpace and then were like not allowed to, to take part in their school sports because someone showed it, even though it was on their private MySpace page, someone saw it and it got around in the school and whatever. So. Right. Yeah, there was a, a story that captivated the US media a while back. Uh, a certain group of girls in a school in Pennsylvania had taken photos of themselves, not even nude, but just like with their bras on or with a towel coming out of the shower and shared those with people over their mobile phones. And that they were actually punished for taking those photos as child pornographers and not the people who shared the photos with each other. And that's actually my real problem with a lot of media stories about sexting, if we want to even, I hesitate to even use the word sexting because I feel like this is a really made up thing. And to bring it back to Heather Corinna and Scarletine, a woman who has contact with literally millions of young people talking about sex and sexuality, and people come to her site, journalists, parents, saying, why aren't you talking about sexting? This is so important. And she's saying our users, young people themselves, actually aren't bringing this up. This isn't really as widespread as the media is making it to be. And so I say that's number one. Like, every story about sexuality, because they happen in such a vacuum of accurate information, is what most people are going to see about any given phenomenon, whether that's sexting or this Facebook syphilis crisis that was reported in the British media last week or two weeks ago, that you know Facebook users in Britain were showing high increases of syphilis, therefore you can get syphilis by having sex with people from Facebook, as if Facebook itself is a vector of disease. I think these are really complicated questions, and most of the time reporters are not going to have the time to dive into the actual research being done in the first place, and so they'll just parrot what another journalist said without doing good research. I think Dr. Petra Boynton is a great researcher source for any journalist who wants to talk about sex stories, talk about you know, these scandals and crises and sexuality. Almost every story about sex is framed that way. And very often, journalists won't get to report on like, good things that happen, positive experiences that people have, like good research that comes out. And so find your sex educators that you can trust if you're a journalist and run these stories by them. Dr. Pedro Boynton is one of them, Corey Silverberg at about.com, Heather Corinna certainly on her blog. Use sex educators who've made themselves available as sources of public information to fact check these stories with and to get their take on them because they are paying attention to the research. They are connected to the sources that you need. You're probably not going to get a 16-year-old to give you an interview as a journalist about sex but you can reach out to people who are working in those spaces and are hearing those stories accurately rather than running with another reporter's assumptions and they get repeated down the line. Then they show up in my Google News Reader and I'm pissed off, so don't do it. <laughs> Not sure where we are at for time. You can take maybe two more questions. And if there's no more questions, I have a plan for all of you. I am such a teacher and no one's getting out early. Okay, all right, well, I, um, I've never been on chat roulette. <laughs> and I, you know, just to drive home the point that sex is really about ordinary people, and also to test this journalist's assumption that like chat roulette is basically about dicks and like dudes masturbating, like I'm sure it is. I've never actually experienced this myself. So would you guys all go on chat roulette with me right now? Like, will you? You're okay with watching this? Like, do you consent to this? Okay, I just wanted to get your consent first. All right, allow. Steve Jobs did not design this microphone at a, at a flattering angle. I don't want to date. You guys help me, what do I do next? I'm told, I really am a virgin. Do I, new game? Oh my god. Hi. You're live in Berlin if you want to talk to us. Hey. Next. Okay. Oh, can you put this on the screen, please? These guys really want to see chat roulette. Thank you. All right. Hi. 
Hi. Oh, you look very young. Um, I don't mean to be creepy. How old are you? Next. Okay, so what do you guys want to bet it's a cat? How long is that going to take? Next. Maybe. Okay. Wait, you don't think they want to look at me? Okay. Does this happen? Is this our fault? Right, let's go bring this to Jeff Jarvis over at the, uh, the bathhouse or wherever he is right now naked. All right. Well, until somebody decides they want to be our friend, does anybody have a final? Oh. Oh, hey! Yay! <laughs> Did I scare him? I tried to turn it around, but there's like 8 million wires up here. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hey there. I, I don't mean Hello. to... <laughs> okay, next. This is amazing. How come there's no girls? How long do you think it'll take to... Oh. oh. I feel very rejected. All right. Well, our final thought, if somebody has one, they can, they can take the stage. And, oh, that did not take long. No, I have to ask his permission first. Come on, you guys. I can't even see if there's a computer. Like, where is it? Is he, like, over here? Hey. <laughs> Did it just wave at me, or is it just me? I can't. He didn't say yes. Okay, how many people think I should hit next? How many people want to stay right here? Okay. No. No. Sorry. Only with my friends. Okay. They can watch. No problem. All right. Hold on. This is how it always is, right? You're like, I'm so ready to do the thing, and now I have to like move the computer and eight million other things. Okay. <laughs> oh my God, he's watching. Hi. Hi. Do you have audio on? No. Aw. Okay. I think that may have been the biggest chat roulette group anything I have heard of yet. If you have had a bigger group chat roulette experience, uh, email me and tell me. But otherwise, I'm claiming this experience we all just had as the largest mass sexual experience on chat roulette ever. Oh, you guys. You guys are like a, a picture of chat roulette. Like, you're like, like whatever. I swear you were in the New York Times. Hi. OK. Well, I really am going to take a final thought. They were adorable, right? But uh, I think we got what we were looking for, or maybe what everybody said was there. And if I were a really lazy journalist, I would definitely say chat roulette is all about dicks, for sure. That is all that's there, and there are no girls. Um, and everyone knows English, who types, anyway. Um,
So I, I'm not sure exactly what the composition of the room is. I didn't ask people to stand up and say who makes tech and who writes things and who posts pictures of themselves to Facebook and who is a journalist and who's setting policy, but I would hope that we could all in all of those parts of our lives start to hold some more of these awkward and uncomfortable truths about sex as we go into those spaces. This isn't just about other people who have sex. We all have sex. This matters to all of us. And don't forget that the next time you're building something or making something or telling other people how they should live on the internet. Thank you guys so much. Das Mikrofon kaputt oder was? Ja.